okay, people are slowly coming in. Um, I see the numbers climbing, so that's good. Um, hello, everyone. Um, as you're coming in, um, if you'd like to let us know where you're tuning in from, that'd be great. Um, maybe what brought you here together, um, or what brought you here today, um, or um, what's one of your favorite August uh, plays by August Wilson? Um, mm -hmm. That could be another thing, or your one of your favorite productions as well. Um, yeah, let's just start uh, some conversation in the chat. Um, and please remember, uh, when you put something in the chat, um, you can click on everyone so everybody can see it, and not just uh, not just us three. Um, so uh, the numbers have slowed down, so I'm just gonna go ahead with my introduction. Um, hi everyone, I'm Omar Acevedo and I'm the Literary Program Coordinator here at the Mark Twain House and Museum. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for this virtual program for August Wilson Alive. Um, first, I want to thank our sponsors. Our virtual programs are produced in part with support honoring the late Frank Lord. We are happy to honor his memory with these programs. And we are also incredibly grateful to the Wish You Well Foundation and Connecticut Public WNPR for supporting all of our virtual programs. Um, if you're not a member, um, please consider supporting our museum by becoming a member. All members receive free admission to our author programs, the house and museum, year-round discounts in the store and cafe and much more. Uh, please visit our website for more information or you can reach out to me um, and I can uh, send you that link. Um, now on to our guests, um, our author, Patty Hartigan is an award-winning theater critic and arts reporter who spent many years on the staff of the Boston Globe. Um, and our moderator, Tanisha Dugan, is a theater producer and director based in Middletown, Connecticut. Now we encourage you to have a conversation in the chat, like I said um, at the top of the, of the show. Um, if you have a specific question though, um, please put that in the Q&A section, it's on the bottom left. Okay. Um, and uh, just we just don't want it to get lost, your question to get lost in the chat. Um, you can also click on the captions to see live auto captioning uh, for the program. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, I would be putting a link in the chat to purchase August Wilson a Life through our museum store. Your purchase will support our museum and our honored guest. Um, so that is all from me. Uh, please sit back and enjoy this conversation and I will turn this over to Patty and Tanisha. Hi everybody. Hi Patty. Hi. It's so I good see. to see you in I, person. I know. I feel like I've known you forever, Tanisha. <laughs> It has been lovely, lovely, lovely to get uh, to know you in our few conversations and to to be in contact with this amazing biography. Um, before we sort of get into the book and August, I kind of wanted to talk to you a little bit about your transition from critic to book writer. Hmm. Well, I left the Boston Globe in 2002. Um, which seems like so long ago. Um, I had three kids very quickly in that time period. Um, and then I freelanced. So I was still a critic, um, but I had always wanted to switch over to writing books at this point in my career. Um, and uh, luckily I, I thought of this, of this particular book after I had seen a production of How I Learned What I Learned at the Huntington Theater Company. And that was in 2016. I. I had talked to August Wilson about the play. I, I knew the person who, Todd Feidler, who collaborated with him. And it was 2016, August Wilson died in 2005. And there had been no biography of this major American playwright who had changed the, the history of American theater. The and I had to do it. <laughs> and I'm so thrilled that I did. Writing a book, um, I think, so a lot of people ask this question is very different from writing a news piece mm -hmm. or a piece for a newspaper. In the olden days, sometimes we would go to a play, um, review it, at, it would end at say 10.30 or 11. We would get a cab, go back to the Globe and the deadline was midnight. Mm -hmm. And you would do it, the copy editor would look at it and you would drive home thinking, I hope I didn't get anything really wrong. <laughs> and then at 6 a.m. when the paper used to show up on your doorstep, you look at it and you go, okay, I'm okay. I don't have to leave town. 
So this is very different. This is a process for me. It was six years mm. of deep research. I had done a lot of um, page one series for the Globe, which were you know four days, page one, several stories, big investigative pieces. Um, but that's different from writing a book. Um, very different. Mm-hmm. And it's a process I love. Yeah, yeah. And you can feel your sort of investigative background in this book because there is it is so rich with stories. It reads, um, the word that kept coming to me is snappy because it, it just reads so, it, it was such a quick read, you know? Like it just, you just get in and you're following these stories of these human beings and it felt very much like an investigative documentary in a lot of ways. So I can, I can feel, and I can see that uh, so much in the, in the, in the work. Can you tell us a little bit about the first time you met August? Sure. Um, back in, um, gosh, when was it? 1986, I had seen a production of um, Joe Turner's Come and Gone at the Huntington Theater. And this was way before it went to Broadway. It was only the second time it had been done. And I ended up getting a grant and going to the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center the following summer in 1987 for the National Critics Institute. And he did not have a play there that summer, but um, once you're a member of that family, you come back and you visit. He came back and he talked to the critics. And after he spoke, um, I asked him some question. We ended up sitting on, under one of the trees for several hours. And he told all, a lot of the stories that are in the book. Um, mm-hmm. And then after that, I was hired by the Globe. And he did his plays, as many of you know, um, he do them at, in the beginning at Yale Repertory Theater and then go to the Huntington and the Goodman and several regional theaters. So he came through Boston often and I would see him and interview him or, um, over the years. And then um, in 2005, when he was getting ready to launch the 10th play in the cycle, Radio Doll, I, um, I had left the Globe, but the Globe magazine had me go out to Seattle to do a magazine piece on him on, on the sixth, the 10th play, his 60th birthday, finishing this thing he had said so many years ago he was going to do. And I spent five years out there and we talked about his whole life, um, which was sort of a perfect precursor to the to the book. He had not been diagnosed yet. It was a few months later that he got diagnosed with inoperable liver cancer, a great tragedy for the world. Um, so that's when I first met him and how I, how I kept in touch with him over the years. I love it. Patty, we're getting some notes that you're hard to hear. Can you turn oh, your mic up a little bit? Yeah, sorry. Everyone tells me I'm so soft-spoken and I think I'm loud. I <laughs> to the computer. Can you hear me now, everyone? I think we'll have we'll have some rousing yeses. You okay. sound better to me. All right. Uh, I'm noticing in the chat and I want to call out um, some uh, productions that are happening uh, as a theater maker. Uh, I was at Theater Works for a number of years, uh, now at Octopus Theatricals. I know how important it is to sort of talk about the work as it's happening, uh, because we are in a tenuous time in theater. So mm-hmm. Pittsburgh Playwrights Theater has a production of Joe Turner's Come and Gone being staged uh, and and come see. I know you guys are seeing this in the chat, but it's all, I just want to repeat it out loud. Um, you saw an amazing production of Fences at Shakespeare and Company that we were chatting about. Uh, that's getting another shout out in the, in the chat as well. Um, and who else am I, anybody else I'm missing? who's got productions. If you've got something you want me to shout out, please please send it here. Um, you said something about your work as a critic and you, and you bring it up in the book in the frame of like the system of theater, um, something that August was uh, sort of chafed against and sometimes you talked about your, your work as a critic and having to hurry up, you know, you had those, that 30 minutes after coming home from the show to sort of get the review out. And then that review, you know, was read that the next day at rehearsals um, and could become a make or break um, or read the next day at opening nights. Um, talk to me a little bit about the system, how you see the system of, of theater sort of operating in this time and what you imagine, I know I do this to you, where I go, what do you think August would say at this time? And you go, I don't want to put too much words in his mouth, but what would you say to him? Because so much of what you put in the book is uh, very prescient. He's kind of Octavia Butler in that way where he talks about things and you're like, oh, we're here in this moment. 
So I'm I'm just curious about your musings on 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 this this moment in theater and also where you think August would uh, position himself or, or respond to in this moment. Yeah, I hate to put words in his mouth. <laughs> um, I really do. Um, it's so different now. The landscape for theater was already troubled. The mm -hmm. pandemic didn't do us any favors, right? Um, mm -hmm. Theaters are going right and left. Theaters you would not expect. Um, to be, have, be having these financial troubles. And it's also really hard to get the audience back. We all got used to this, right? Us sitting, Tanisha and I in our separate places, miles away talking to each other. Um, so it's a tenuous time. Um, I think in terms of the critic system from the olden days, and I should add, sometimes we had you know, a day. It wasn't always. It was only when it was a short run or it was a, a pre-Broadway thing. Um, but, and that's changed. Very few critics do that now. There's a press night way before uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it runs. Um, but during the production of Fences, Lloyd Richards and August Wilson had had some trouble with the producers and Lloyd Richards wrote this, I think it was 10 or 12 page memo um, that it, I found, um, really complaining about the system, that the system as you, I've described it and you've described it, which happens sometimes, is that someone has a really short time to put a stamp on a production without really having time to digest it and to think about it. Um, and critics do their job. I have enormous respect for them. Um, but then the system is that the producers and the publicity people um, sell the play taking these quotes. And Lloyd Richards really felt that, especially with an August Wilson play, with a Joe Turner's come and gone that Pittsburgh Playwrights Theater is doing, um, you need time. You need time to think about that, especially when it's a new play. Um, mm -hmm. And he, he said it so eloquently. He said, you know, people... Uh, use they'll have one pithy thing they say at the cocktail party or at the the next day at the mm -hmm. board meeting or at the water cooler um mm -hmm. i don't know do they still have water coolers in offices um, <laughs> are there anybody is there anybody there around the water exactly, cooler <laughs> they're all like doing this. um and he really chafed about that he felt that um the depth and the real meaning of things were getting lost by the commercial system now as you know as a theater practitioner it's different in the nonprofit world um, mm -hmm. To some extent, at many of the theaters, it's um, uh, it's not about making money; it's about bringing these great plays to people, and they have to find ways to survive. <laughs> so, what was so revelatory to me was the work of Lloyd Richards, not only as a director, but he was really operating as a producer in sort of creating this model of taking the plays, not, you know, from O'Neill to one region to another regional to another regional to another regional. Um, that was like, you know, something about the blood memory, you know, that's a practice of mine as a producer. I had no idea that Lloyd had, had kind of architected this, this, this vision of how to grow a play. I'm curious, you know, cause I'm sure there's a lot of, uh, theater practitioners in the, in the chat here and in, in the webinar today. How do you think in, why, why did that fall apart? You mean the, the relationship of Lloyd Richards and August Wilson? Well, I don't want you to spoil too much of the book, but I'm curious why you think the, you know, in your research, why do you think that that system that Lloyd had put together to develop August plays, why is that not replicated today? Do you, do, do you think it's something that happened over their time together? Was it something that happened just within the theaters independently? You know, it, I think it was a unique situation. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, Lloyd Richards was connected everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, he had his own theater at Yale. Um, he had been in working in the theater since 1959 when he directed um, A Raisin in the Sun on Broadway. Um, and August Wilson was a unique happening in the theater. Um, I know at the Huntington, the then uh, artistic director had gone to Yale and he had seen Ma Rainey on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And he had seen um, Fences and he said, I want, you know, before Fences opened on Broadway, he said, can we do this? I really want to do this. And, and they already had their plans. And so then the Huntington got in on Joe Turner. 
theaters wanted to bring a new August Wilson play to their audiences mm -hmm. for many, many reasons, mm -hmm. um, not the least of which they had done precious little to do uh, plays by um, anyone other than a white male, sometimes mm -hmm. a dead white male. <laughs> and with all due respect to Shakespeare. <laughs> um, I'll do, I'll do. Um, so it, it, was, it was a unique situation. Now you say that you practice this. Do you do your productions at various theaters from theater to theater? I do. I do. I do. It's it's how what what was so like I use the word again revelatory for me is is you talk about the economics of it and that by going to these regional theaters that have their own budgets that are are set off to produce that you're able to instead of having to sort of advance capitalize a work you work with the institutions to produce the work and so you're not taking on any quote unquote risk you're really presenting as a part of their subscription series. Um, and, you know, that sort of blood memory, that generational connection that I didn't realize was like already baked into the cake, right? Um, yeah. Felt really like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm I'm in the lineage. I'm in the line of the work as it was meant that to be. Is. Now, I to hope that can continue because from what I'm reading, the subscription series are really a tough sell now yeah. um, in yeah. this post-pandemic world. Whereas before it was, you were guaranteed at least some audience for all of your plays, right. yeah. um, which was great for playwrights, great for new work because Correct. you're buying Mr. or Mrs. Unknown while you're also getting uh, Shakespeare. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And as a as a writer, you're getting Mr. and Mrs. Unknown to look at your work and respond and make adjustments when you get to the next one, which yeah. is really a one of a kind opportunity. You um hinted at um the relationship between Lloyd and August, which takes up a, a nice section of 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 the book. Um, both you know the sort of mythology of the father son relationship and what that actually looked like behind the scenes without uh giving us a little taste so that we want to make sure and, and get to this beautiful book tell me a little bit about um that relationship um what do you think um what was the what was the moment uh i know from reading but what was the thing that began to um dissemble that relationship and what was the thing that really like pulled it together in the beginning you know lloyd richards was a legend august wilson was um always a writer he was a poet first and then he was writing plays when he was in saint paul and his friend rob penny the poet and playwright had sent him a brochure about the eugene o'neill theater center which is such a unique place um in the olden days um in the early days there would be 12 to 14 playwrights. It was safe. There were no producers allowed in. It was all about the playwright. It wasn't about the actor. Even if the actor had an idea, they didn't do it. So the playwright could see the work. And I have this quote over in this other part of my office where he said, um, it's a place where you can fail and your life won't be over. Mm -hmm. So he met, and then he tried five times. He got rejected, rejected by, you know, plays like Jitney which now we all know and love, but it was an early version. And he finally got accepted with Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. And he went there and he met this legend who, you know, he was 14 years old when Lloyd was on Broadway with um, Lorraine Hansberry. Right, right. Um, and the place was magical for playwrights. Um, and the way that Lloyd Richards ran it, it truly was about the playwright. Um, sometimes to the point where, you know, if you said something that, you meant to be constructive, but it came off as negative. You'd feel like you were in the principal's office. <laughs> um, um, and so that's where the relationship built. Lloyd knew the theater. August knew how to write plays. Um, Lloyd also, um, and I use just their first names when I'm talking at great length because it's just easier. I have enormous respect for both of them. I was terrified of Lloyd Richards when I first met him as a young critic. Um, but they they had they both brought something to the table mm -hmm. and it was the right place at the right time and um lloyd richards had had this career and he had seen athel fugard the great south african playwright he brought mm -hmm. his place to broadway but where was the next great african-american playwright and he found it in august wilson so mm -hmm. it was the perfect partnership when mm -hmm. when he when august wilson started out 
he said this all the time, and I actually believe him. He, when he started out as a poet, he read every poet you could possibly read, and then he wasn't successful. So when he started writing plays, he thought, I'm not reading those guys. I'm not reading them. I'm going to do my own thing. So he needed to learn about structure. He needed to learn that you can't have an actor at the end of a scene soaking wet, wet clothes, and then be right at the top of the next scene in you know, right. dry hair. And he didn't <laughs> know that. And then he saw it at the O'Neill. He was like, uh-oh, he can't do that. So they, they really worked well together. And Lloyd Richards had a way of working that he asked questions of the mm -hmm. actors and of the playwright. He didn't tell you what to do. He didn't say, oh, you know, oh, give line readings, God forbid. Um, and that, I think, inspired someone like August Wilson, who respected Lloyd Richards, to go back and say, huh, why is he asking the question here? So mm -hmm. it was a really, really good partnership, and it shows in those first six plays. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like Lloyd was really director, but also dramaturg. Oh, absolutely. Yes, yeah. absolutely. He was not at the O'Neill. He was, you know, head honcho at the O'Neill, and you can't do both. So right. he was he was hands off with the playwrights, but then after when it went to Yale Rep, um, and so they had this relationship, and like any relationship, um, August Wilson grew, and he got to know the theater, and he got to know how it worked, and um, there was, and I'm not going to spoil this; we shouldn't go into it. But there, as I mentioned earlier, there was a big brouhaha with the production of Fences on Broadway, and they felt like they were losing control. And they had to demand control. After that, August Wilson would never let anyone. It was his work and he got it done the way he wanted it done. Mm -hmm. And you grow over the years and, you know, if you want to be the boss, you can't have two people in charge. You can't have two directors. Yeah. yeah. Or in the case of Fences, you know, not three directors, but three very powerful men. You alluded to uh, James Earl Jones uh, earlier in our conversation. Um, and one of... I think one of my favorite moments is when uh, James points out that all three men are married to white women. And they're talking about how they maneuver in this business and, and August sort of not um, always loving the way that James maneuvered in mm -hmm. the industry, that he sort of felt that um, James was a little too uh, willing to sort of compromise I'll say maybe that's too strong a word but compromise in the way of white producers white um entertainment culture writ large and uh August was was not about that because August identified himself as black and very for that uh for that mission I mean one of the quotes I have today that he said that you say is that today when you see a revolution and it's your revolution you don't you don't uh you don't get out of the way you join. Yes. And it's like the difference between James and August in terms of their approach to the work feels like a part of that tension. Can you talk to us a little more about that relationship between those two you men? Know, it's funny, you, you mentioned that quote. That quote was from 1969 when they were doing a birthday party for Malcolm X in mm -hmm. Pittsburgh. Um, I didn't get into, and August didn't get into, who James Earl Jones was in the theater community. Um, and I know there's a lot of talk about that, but he didn't get into that and I'm not gonna get into that. But on that particular production, you had a star. You had Darth Vader <laughs> um, creating this role. And um, he wanted to he wanted the, the, it to be written the way he wanted it to be written. Um, and so did he, the producer that he got very t close with. Um, and that was a real test of, um, of Wilson, and in fact, at one point, at one point when they were just about to go into rehearsal on Broadway, they fired Lloyd Richards. You can't mm -hmm. fire the playwright. Yeah. <laughs> who fires Lloyd Richards? Oh, I love that. And James <laughs> steps into the into the <laughs> role, <laughs> and then later they bring him back, probably begging right. um, to exactly. come back. Um, yeah. yeah, who fired? I, I, um, so. They, they definitely had different ways of operating. They were both at different points in their career, too, remember? Yeah. I mean, before Fences, he had not won a Tony. He had not won a Pulitzer. He had had Ma Rainey on Broadway. Um, and he was writing Fences to prove that he could write a well-made play with a mm -hmm. tragic hero and a tragic right. ending and, you know, a family unit. Um, um, so, so uh, yeah, on that production, they did have very different ways of approaching it. And um, in the end, I had just, I, as you said, I saw that production at Shakespeare and Company. 
and you think, oh, I have seen Kansas 3,000 times, and I, you know, don't spoil the ending. They were magnificent. Yes. And that- That is the word on the street, so kudos to them. Oh, yeah, and Frankie Faison, the original Gabriel, was playing Troy. Uh -huh. He had to pull two weeks before it opened because of COVID. So the one, the actor playing Gabriel stepped into Troy's role because he had played it before. They got someone else to come in to play Gabriel. That's synchronicity. And, and, you know, the audience doesn't know any of this. The actors told me, I mean, I figured out because I could see that the names had changed wow. on the website. And that ending, and for those, I don't know who's out there and I don't know whether you've seen Fences, but the ending is one of the best endings in the history of American theater. Seriously, mm -hmm. one of the best endings. And it, re it relies on this character, Gabriel. Yeah, she's blowing that <laughs> horn. Um, who's ushering someone into heaven with his horn. And he, the horn doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. At Shakespeare and Company, no matter how many times I had seen this, I, I cried three times. Yeah, and yeah. That, it was fabulous. Yeah. So yeah. they're lasting plays. They are uh, lasting. You know, I, we got from James Earl Jones too, because they wanted to change the ending. And... Lloyd Richards and August Wilson said, we are not changing that. Yes. Thank God they did. <laughs> yeah, thank God they did. And and what a long protracted battle. Like, it's so interesting that change in the ending, like it was, it, they didn't, the producers didn't let it go. Yeah. It was something that seemed to go on for such a long time. And I uh, admire those artists for never backing down. And I also find it really curious when producers want to get in the way of an artist's work. Um, because, you know, I, I believe artists are the visionaries of our futures, of our pasts. You know, they are they are writing the pictures for us. And sometimes you got to let them write it, you know, as they and, see yeah. it. But yeah, and, and with Fences, there was, um, the script was marked up in pink and blue. It was color coded. This has to go, this you have to think about. And I, yeah, you know, this is, I, you must get rid of this in yellow. Yellow is a no-go. <laughs> I said to a playwright, I said, oh, have you ever seen anything like this before? And he said, what are you kidding me? Producers do it all the time. Yeah. There was yeah. nothing unique about this. So gosh, stick to your guns, playwrights. Yes, yeah, stick to your guns, playwrights. One of the things that I love about the structure of this, of this autobiography is that you take us on, you know, from before he is born with his aunt up on the mountaintop to his death. Um, and we have uh, someone in the chat talking about King Headley. Um, and I, and I was really intrigued by his, um, he had committed himself to writing this 10 play cycle. And he was like, I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm going to cover, um, this time in black life. And he gets to the eighties and he's like, I'm not sure what to write. My head was down. I was, I was making work. I was trying to keep my family together. Like I don't, I wasn't of or in the culture. I don't understand hip hop. Um, and my our friend Phyllis is like I saw one uh, you know they're doing actually King Headley next um, oh. summer, but I'd love you to just share a little bit from the book about that process for him in getting Headley uh, out into the world. Well, that one was difficult for so many reasons. He had been asked to inaugurate the brand new Pittsburgh Public Theater, which was a you know what it takes to get a new theater in a city. This I do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This Shout out to Theater Works and their renovation. Absolutely. Years yeah. <laughs> 12 years in the works, the biggest thing to ever happen. It's, you know, it's Pittsburgh. It's where he's from, where he was. He had to drop out of school because he was accused of plagiarism, where all the old ladies on the street thought he was a nut um, mm -hmm. walking around with, with his, all the tweed jacket, and, all that. jacket and, the, and the notepad and reciting poetry. Um, so this is big for him. He hadn't written the play and the theater was going to open and it was 1999, right? Remember how we all felt at the end of the millennium? I we, do. We thought, why 2 k We thought it was all going to end. Exactly. So you have all this stuff going on and he's got to write the play. Plus, as you said, he never could wrap his head around the 80s. Um, and he talked to his younger brother, Richard is nine years younger and he talked to him about it. And he talked to his friend, the novelist, Charles Johnson, who agreed with him, who also hated hip hop and who hated the 80s. He did an interview with some young, fabulous, it was a great interview I found online. And he said, oh yeah, I'm gonna, you know, I said I was gonna listen to hip hop, but I couldn't do it, I had on the blues because you wouldn't have hip hop if you didn't have the blues. Yeah. So 
I think that was really difficult for him to write that play. And I think it shows in the play. I, mm -hmm. I, I say that in the book and I'll say it here. However, Tanya, the character, has a speech about bringing a baby into this world. And especially now with Roe v. Wake, um, and how, how can you bring a baby into the world when baby might get shot, baby might shoot someone, the police might shoot the baby, you know, your baby, we're mothers. Um, and Viola Davis gave that speech on Broadway and she won the Tony Award for it. And it, for the rest of the play, I don't care for that speech. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. You're shaking your head because you know, I mean. I am because I'm trying not to cry because that speech as the mom of two black sons, oh, having nothing to do with the choice of having them. Like, can I, can I make that choice? But of the reality, I never wanted sons. For the, for the exact reason that August put into Tanya's mouth, those words um, have you always mean, meant so much to me. You're making me cry too. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, I, my, my, my kids are half Chinese, half white, um, mm -hmm. and it's a different world. But mm -hmm. as a mother, as any mm -hmm. mother, I dedicate mm -hmm. the book to all mothers, mm -hmm. to my mother first, but to mm -hmm. all mothers. Mm -hmm. And I, I, whose love is both tender and fierce. Yes. And that's what your love has to be. Yes, yes, yes. It's tender yes. and fierce because you have to protect. Yes. And that, yes. That, yeah, um, that speech is just, you probably hear people do it for auditions all the time. Because oh, it was wow. it was one of really? mine, you know, when I was- oh, was a, it really? Yeah, oh well, my God, when I was a college, of course. <laughs> Exactly. It was a little um, bit for us, Tanisha. Not, yeah, no, seriously. Yeah. Oh, you'll cry again. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, what I, you know, you talk a lot about, you know, we, we talked about these women in the in his works and so often he gets a bad rap for yeah. his women. And I actually, you know, you make a point that like for the Viola Davises and the Esipatha Murkisons, like this was the opera for the Angela Bassett's. These were the opportunities for them to really be in their own bodies, in their own voices, speaking to these women. And I actually think there's something really brilliant about the way that August writes women, because he writes women from a Black man's perspective, right? And so there's this opportunity for these women to be ever present, and that there are so many multitudes within these women, he could never write it all in the place. And so the space for them to sort of for any actress to step into, you know, one of my favorite plays is uh, is uh, Two Trains Running. I know people are like, I, you know, poor Risa. And I'm like, no, she is there. And that actress crafting that role gets to pick how she individually interacts with these men based on the actors that are in that cast. That it, to me, it's it's brilliant and beautiful and 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 appropriate. But I'd love to hear from you, you know, why do you think he got that rap? Do you think that, um, you know, just just what, what, yeah, are, your, what are your thoughts yeah. on the women? You know, I, I, I do think in the earlier plays, the women weren't as strong. Mm -hmm. um, I also don't think they were directed to be strong mm -hmm. in the early productions. Mm -hmm. uh, um, for instance, the the piano lesson that was just on Broadway. Mm -hmm. um, Bernice, yeah. Danielle Brooks brought um, a sensuality and a strength to that character because she was directed that way and she mm -hmm. was allowed to do that on stage. Mm -hmm. When I originally saw it, it wasn't, it was kind of, you know, don't touch me, I'm a holy woman. Um, mm -hmm. And um, of course it was directed by a woman, Victoria Jackson. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I saw Joe Turner's Come and Gone at the Huntington. Again, they did it when they inaugurated their renovated theater. And um, the, the female characters were just directed in a way where she was running that house Seth wasn't running that house mm -hmm. and you don't have to change a single line. Right. So there is strength in them. And when you think, um, I do, I do will say that I do think the early characters were, were weak because they were being written through his eyes and mm -hmm. what he saw was his mother and he worshiped his mother. Mm -hmm. um, I hope my boys worship me that way. <laughs> um, but yeah, but when but then when you think about it, you think, I mean, people say with rows and fences, mm -hmm. why didn't she leave that man? She take you know, she took the baby. Of course she's gonna take the baby, but come on. Um, who gets the best speech? Rose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you a womanless male. Mm -hmm. Tanya and Headley, who gets the best monologue? Mm -hmm. Tanya. Mm -hmm. 
in seven guitars, he touched me here, he touched me there. It's Vera who gets the great monologue. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it depends on the production mm -hmm. and um, and the way that they're they're shown. I, I still, I don't know. I wish I, with Risa and Two Trains running, I want, I want to see more of her backstory on stage. I felt like she was silenced because the act of cutting yourself to protect mm -hmm. yourself from the the male sex mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is huge. But it I, is. Yeah. But I never and I, I don't I don't know I don't see that. There's a backstory and I know there's a backstory and as yeah. an actor, I'm sure you make one. Um, well, that's what I'm saying. I said the beauty and, and sort of the yeah. Shakespearean aspect of it is that you can create your biography for yeah. all the things that happen off stage are yours to imagine. And you can pull from your own sense memory. I know that's taboo these days. The kids don't do that anymore for all the reasons. Uh, but you, you can write your own story. You can use your own imagination. Um I love Renee says, I think he was taking control of these women. He came from a family that the women had to be strong. Yeah. And you don't always know your mother's story, right? Oh, like, he yeah. He, all um, of us, right? Like yeah. you don't know your mother's story. You don't know the woman she was before, but she carries all of that into the room. Renee, thank you so yeah, much. For and, that. and let me, um, when he was first started reading, um, when he went to the library after he left school, um, he read a Langston Hughes poem called Mother and Son. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time he realized that this woman who did everything for those six kids in that house mm -hmm. had another life. Mm -hmm. And he, he said, he said, he read it. He said, oh, I realized my mother <laughs> it wasn't just about me. Yeah, yeah. There's a past. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, and the women in that, the, the, Renee Wilson, who just wrote that, is one of them. <laughs> She's one of those strong Wilson women. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I mean, that, that's why... I dedicated it to all the book to all mothers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so. I think of, you know, I, I think of his mother and I think of her naming her son, Frederick. I think of her marrying Frederick on the back end. I think of all of the things, the, the calculations and the choices that you make to keep your children safe and sound. And those are uh, quiet battles. You don't know how long she was considering that or if it was always something in her mind or something she came up with, you know. Yeah, we can't know. We can't after know. The, right, yeah. But to people out there, she, um, his mother, Daisy Wilson, um, did not marry um, Frederick Kittle. And the myth was that she was, that she, that she was married to him and he was just never home and he was off getting yeah. drunk. Um, but she married him when he was dying yeah. so the kids would get the social security benefits and that's that's really a smart woman right mm -hmm. um, and in fact it, august younger youngest brother richard said she said no she married him because um you know hold those children down you got that piece of paper you get the benefits yeah. yeah you do this beautiful thing where you your voice in the autobiography connects to the way in which August writes the plays, there's a lot of atmospherics. You talk about the weather and use the weather to contextualize what's happening inside of a uh, a theater or what's happening, you know, inside of a meeting that's happening. Um, was that a conscious choice, or was that something that sort of just being inside of August and the way that he writes and the way that he tells story became a part of the way that you built this autobiography? You know, I think I just started started doing it that it that it felt to me that you cannot create a, a picture of a person if you don't place them somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a rather long beginning to the O'Neill chapter mm -hmm. where you really get a sense and you're you're close by. <laughs> you're in Hartford. Um, and writing that because I had been there and I had lived in those dorms and I had, had felt what it was like to be at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center, it felt to me like you can't bring someone to, to life unless um, you have a sense of place. Mm -hmm. um, I, You know, one thing I d didn't do, I don't think, is a sense of smell, which I love it when you, you can do it in the novel, mm -hmm. um, but I certainly couldn't make up <laughs> you know, uh, mm -hmm. that. Um, but it's really important, and I think it's really important by, in biographies, which um, sometimes you just have fact after fact after fact after fact, 
yeah. yet you don't get a feel for what it was like to be there. Yeah. And yeah. facts are important. <laughs> yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you really honor storytelling in yeah. the delivery of all of these facts, which was just, I think what what led to what I said, snappy. I think it's what leads to you just driving into it deeper and deeper until you get to those last pages and you're like, ah, you know, um, because it is just, it's really beautiful storytelling in addition to just sharing the, the, the facts of this man's life. Um, I want to encourage you all to get some, some uh, questions in the chat uh, so we can ask Patty anything that's on your mind. Um, I'm looking through our, our notes here just to see if anything's come up yet. Uh, doo -doo -doo. I know you could, we could talk about fences all day, all day. Actually, one play we haven't talked about, which I, which uh, I'll let you answer first, which is what is your favorite August Wilson play? I think it's pretty obvious from the conversation so far, but it's absolutely Joe Turner's coming up. It absolutely is. Um, uh, when I first saw that, I was pretty young, um, and I was, you know, had this dream I was going to be a drama critic. I was going to write for a newspaper. And sitting in that theater on that night with people who had never seen this, they had never heard Harold Harold Loomis talk about bones walking on water, which mm -hmm. brings up four hundred years of history. Mm -hmm. And to to it was electric. I still get shivers thinking about it um and that that to me just encompasses everything he was trying to do um mm -hmm. in those plays but i mean it's that's my one favorite play. i like i love so many of the other ones for different reasons i mean you gotta love jitney those characters are just like your next door neighbor who's so yeah. nosy <laughs> i mean they have tragedy and they have joy and they have so many things but you just love them yeah. um the director marion mcclinton said you know Black, white, green, Martian. You know these people. people. Um, so there are different reasons to love the, the different plays. And Hadley, I love because of that speech tweet that makes us cry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know? I think one of the things, you know, we talked about this, you know, early on, that makes August so perennial is that these are specifically Black plays. But as you brought up from um, director McClinton and as well as... Um, there's another person in your in in the book that also talks about. I want to say it may have been one of his early producers that says, "Oh my God, this is my dad, right?" And then he created this mythology where he retells the story, and he's like, "Yeah, you know, her 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 father was Portuguese, her father was Chinese, her father, but that they saw themselves in these works." What do you think it is about the way that he writes or these characters? that are so evergreen, are so accessible to all. Hmm. He did read Joseph Campbell. Um, mm. And you think of fences and you think of the father-son, the archetype. Um, so there's that. I mean, some of the situations are certainly, you know, mother-child, <laughs> father-son, husband-wife. Um, yet he just I created characters that were so rich. Mm -hmm. and had so many sides and like you say there's a story out there off stage mm -hmm. um that they reached people and it's also the combination of good old storytelling mixed with funny humor comedy um but also the poetry yeah um, think about the american theater who writes poetry like that maybe eugene o'neill mm -hmm. um uh it, it's it's shakespearean stuff um and you know, it can be argued that sometimes those monologues will stop the action cold. Yeah. But when you hear the monologue, it stands yeah. on its own. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't mind that it stopped. It's like, okay, now tell me what's gonna happen next. But we had a little moment where um, Levy is is giving mm -hmm. you know a monologue that makes you sob. Um, yeah. It's worth it. Yeah. I think all those, he had everything, didn't he? Yeah. You know, he had, <laughs> It's a wonder because you you brought you bring up his his poetry, his connection to rhythm and lyricism, and I it, it draws me back to his inability to connect with the eighties because so much of hip hop is essentially poetry that it it in some way breaks my heart that he wasn't able to find his 
uh, successor within that number, because I do think that there is something to what you're saying about that the rhythm and the and the and the and the verse and the prose all working together to be something specifically him um and also specifically black you know specifically black american um creative expression do you think was there a heir apparent um maybe that he never spoke of but that he uh saw you know you know he didn't talk about that I, I think he knew that it was such a burden to put on somebody or to choose, um, say he named five playwrights, but he didn't name the sixth one. Mm -hmm. How does, how, what's going to happen to the career of the sixth playwright? Um, some people point to Susan. But Morgan. what could happen to the career of the five? I know, I know. <laughs> um, um, it, he certainly opened doors um, mm -hmm. and um, opened hearts and minds uh, to some degree. We talked about this backstage <laughs> when we first talked um mm -hmm. you know he he was theaters knew they had to change but they just didn't yeah. and then he came along and he helped them do it mm -hmm. um to a degree mm -hmm. um and even now i mean there were playwrights pulling their work because they look at a season and they say i'm the only person of color there's no woman um so Things change and they you know peace are change, right? You know, they don't change. Um I so love I don't that. Think he anointed anyone. Yeah. I, I he was he was extremely supportive behind the scenes of you know startup African American theaters, but mm -hmm. he didn't tell anybody he was privately giving the money or he was privately going to see the productions and maybe somebody would find out and it would appear in the little gossip column. But um he was very supportive of individuals privately. Uh, I, I remember you talk about, he says, you know, I worked at these theaters and everybody was white. I didn't see a, a black person until I saw the security guards. And I think about one, you know, our, our projects on Broadway and it's exactly the same thing. You don't see a black face until you, until you see the security guards. And it's, uh, it is a wonder that the change is so slow, but, 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 and yet it is our friend Mark in the chat. He talks about, you know, for him, the most indelible play is Gem of the Ocean um, and the beautiful way in which he's named on Esther to sort of sound uh, like ancestor. Talk to us about the creation of that, uh, that work. Oh, that had a long road. That <laughs> He wasn't quite ready when he was rewriting that one um, as well. Um, but the, it's, Aunt Esther had appeared in previous plays, but off stage as mm -hmm. this mythological keeper of the history who's, you know, uh, her age is always the same number of years from 1619 when the first um, ships with enslaved people arrived on the shores of Jamestown. Um, but he brings her on stage and lo and behold, she's got a pot of chicken feet on the stove. She's she's so scolding the people who work for her. She's like everybody's grandmother. Mm -hmm. um, her business, she knows everybody's business. She's she is um, the Aunt Esther that everybody should have. Um, and I, I found that to be so wonderful and so refreshing. And she's mentoring the, her protege who's gonna take over for her. Mm -hmm. um, that play was really important for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, it had a long way to go. It, <laughs> it lost money. It, um, uh, it, had, it had some trouble and then it finally opened and it closed too early. Um, yeah. another, another play I had to go into the theater, which yeah. is which is what happens with commercial theater. Yeah. Um, but it's revived and it's done over and over. Um, so, um, if I'm correct, uh, Alicia Rashad played Aunt Esther, right? She, she did. Yeah. She did. She did. I mean, is there anything more appropriate than than the, yeah. that grand dame? You know. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And I mean, what a role for anybody. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It's. Um, he said that Anne Esther was his favorite of all the characters. And you can see why. Yeah. I mean, she's in all of the plays, even if she's not named in the plays. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. She she is in in many ways the blood memory, you know. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, um I, I'd love to, does Mark in the chat say why he loves that play? Is it because of that? Yes, he says, he says the, her emotional outpouring with Citizen. And oh, all yeah. the other characters, the tension between Black Mary and Caesar, 
Uh, yes. Kate oh. saw Felicia as uh, Aunt Esther at Hartford stage. Um, yeah. For the production. Yeah. 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 It's one of my favorites too. Yeah. It's interesting. It's not one that it feels like in the uh, zeitgeist comes up as like, and I don't think of Aunt Esther as, you know, the same as um, Rose or the same as, you know, like she, they do, you know, even Ma Rainey, right? When you think of sort of like the queens of August writing, Aunt Esther doesn't, doesn't fly up for me. It, do you think that's true across the, the landscape? I could be a... Oh, you know, because she's off stage and she really represents the history when you don't see her. Yeah. Um, uh, it's yeah, I think it's hard for people to imagine her as one of the queens because you don't see her. And yeah. then when you finally see her and she's, you know, her feet are rooted in the ground. And when she tells a character yeah. <laughs> two trades to throw $20 in the river, she's, she, she's just, you know, giving them something to do. She's yeah. so yeah. great. Um, I think when you finally get to see her and then when he kills her off in Headley, um, which is the 80s, the era he didn't understand, he feels like Anne Astor can't possibly survive this. Mm -hmm. He couldn't survive it. How can she? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, I love her. And um, she, um, in the beginning of the book, when we go, I go back and I talk about his, his ancestors, he had his great grandmother lived on a mountain and she could have been Anne Astor. I was just, yeah. She could have been Ann Astor. And um, um, this is a shout out to Renee Wilson, who I think is in the group. Um, she and I climbed the mountain in North Carolina, uh, Spear, North Carolina, and found the homestead where the hearth was still there. And talk about the blood's memory. I saw it running through Renee. And um, I think that to me also makes Ann Astor so much more powerful because she's a force. Um, he felt very strongly that the young people, you know, probably, you know, people my age <laughs> um, were losing the history. They weren't paying attention to grandma and grandpa. He felt that. And you got it. You have to know your past. You have to know your history. And that's why I love that character so much. I feel like there's an accidental metaphor in there because, you know, as he built the plays, I think it feels like his uh, understanding of how these all of these characters fit in the August Wilson cinematic universe, you know, and the sort of accidental metaphor of losing your ancestors at that time, and then being in this moment where where we are now, where most often in American life now you are separated from your elders. And that we are in a time where there is no, and I do think it started in the 80s, there is no thread connecting us from the 60s to today, I, right? It's like the civil rights movement happened. We sort of had Obama and now we're here. And we don't have the the step-by-step -step pieces that actually got us to today. Yeah. And we don't have the folks to talk to. In, the, in our homes to just, you know, bring up, uh, oh you know, this reminds me of that, or this reminds that, me of, of that. That is exactly, yes. Yeah. Not having that, I mean, the ancestral memory, even in you saying back to the 60s, that's not that long ago. Okay. And we put our elders, you know, in homes and far away. And um, we do need to remember. I had a thought about that, but now I can't think of what it was, but you absolutely hit on it. And I think he really, really felt that. Yeah. He, I mean, in a way, he was a little old fashioned. He thought that, you know, we should still be in the 50s. <laughs> um, but it was also about the history and about the memory and the fact that his mother's generation didn't talk about their past because they wanted, they didn't want that. I remember. Kids. They yeah. didn't want them to know that. They yeah. were looking towards the future with hope, as we still are today. Right, yeah. and mothers today are still thinking the same things because we've come a little bit, a little bit, but we haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah, I know. I think that's why I love Anne Astor so much. And Mark, yeah. I I hear you on Gemma Yeah. Yeah. Um. I. Uh, yes. Um. Something. This made me think about. Um. I believe he said this, but it may have been James. So ex correct me on whose mouth this came from. But he talks about our Jewish brethren and how 
you know, when they look back to their past, they don't erase it. They don't forget it. But for black Americans, it's like, we're not going to talk. We don't want to talk about slavery. We want to, you know, I, I totally believe in having a soft life, right? Like Mm. to have a life that is, is ease is filled with ease, but I don't want that to be at the um, expense of my history. That was hard. Right. And so it's this interesting balance. And I loved, I believe August said it where he's like, you don't have to lose that. You don't have to forget that. He changed when Miss Seder was, but he the first Seder we went to, uh, when the line in Egypt, we were slaves. And they do it every single year with for yeah. August Wilson with a ritual ceremony that involves food and involves words and involves the children finding, you know, it involves family. Yeah. And how yeah. August, I mean, it's so August Wilson. It's yeah. in the place. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, and he felt he was afraid that people were losing losing the, the memories yeah shout um, out to the wilson family for doing and i hope renee you guys are still doing it uh the family gathering around daisy's birthday i just thought yes i love that you know you talk about um uh, the 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 ritual the yearly you know sojourn that the family takes to be together um around his mother's birthday you talk a lot about august sort of setting up this mythology of himself mm-hmm. from the way that he dressed and presented himself to the voice that he took on to the evolutions of his stories um, as a way to mark the way that he was here and how is he, and how he was here. If you were to um, uh, put a perfect bow around mm-hmm. the mythology of August Wilson, how would you describe that? Mm-hmm. You know, I think I think it's important to say that mythology was important to him because he thought it was lacking that all these, you know, as you say, the Seder, there's a there's a, a mythology, there's a whole system of belief built around that. And he felt that he that was lacking. Um so I, you know, in his own way, maybe he's he's Uncle Esther. Um, <laughs> um he 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 um, and I, I don't want to put too much, I don't want to wrap a new bow around him because I don't want him to um, become like essentialized. He's, he, he, he gets to be who he was. He was August Wilson, first and foremost, a writer who had a vision. Mm-hmm. And his vision was to honor not just one century. That's how it's often presented. It was 400 years. Mm-hmm. And even beyond that, because he, he there were times he, in poetry that he wrote, he would take it all the way back across mm-hmm. the oceans mm-hmm. um, to the great ancestors um, and to to African culture. So, and boy, you know how many people set out to do something that huge to honor an entire you know people and do it and accomplish it on your deathbed. Yeah. Um, um, so that's the bow that I would put around him. Um, that he he didn't want us to forget and we can't forget his legacy is enormous. I want to honor you for taking the time to honor his legacy, to give us such a complete look at his life from before he was born till his till his closing, his closing number the care and the love and the depth that you get into here is is worthy of the magnitude you speak of him in and so i am so grateful to you for these words it is if you are a theater maker a theater lover a theater historian it is essential reading this book will be like the books that you talk about august having where there are you know i'll have to tape it together um, because it has become a, a a reference for me as a producer, as a theater maker, as a person. I'm so grateful to you and your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Miss Hardigan, for your time. And thank you for your, your wonderful thoughts and your friendship. And um, we need to connect because I see you have the the un, the, the uncorrected galleys, and I want to send you an <laughs> autographed copy of the oh. uh, well, hold on. Of the official. <laughs> yes, honey. Yes, <laughs> gorgeous. So I will we'll connect Beautiful. and I will sign it for you. And yes, I'll yes. Part- that'll be the one. That'll be the one that stays pristine while this one gets. <laughs> <laughs> it 
it's changed a little bit since that one. But thank you to everybody for coming too. It is such an honor to have such interest in this, in August Wilson's story. Yes. The Hartford community is so grateful to have you, Patty. You guys in the chat are amazing. I I miss you all too. I know I used to host at uh, Theater Works these lovely conversations with amazing artists like Patty. I am grateful to do it with you all today. You are fantastic, Omar. You are fantastic for, for having me back to talk to our community about amazing work like this. And shout out to the Mark Twain House for hosting. Yes. Thank yeah. you so much. This Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Patty, and thank you, Tanisha. Um, it, this has been a, a really awesome conversation, um, and it will be on the um, uh, Mark Twain YouTube channel um, for forever, maybe, <laughs> for as long as we have the internet. <laughs> uh, but it will be posted uh, in the next day or so. Um, and uh, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for everything. Okay. Yeah, have a great day, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye.